Okay, welcome to the W3C technical working group call for uh, Thursday, the 7th of July. Um, we will be uh, getting feedback on the uh, hopefully penultimate or ultimate draft of the membership specification. Um, before we start in on that, however, I'll just go around and ask everyone to introduce themselves for the sake of the call in the order that they appear on my screen. So starting with uh, Phil, please. Uh, Phil Allen, Senior Dev at Gladstone. Thank you, Phil. Nick? Nick from Ryan. <laughs> Nick from Ryan. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tim, Tim Corby. Uh, Tim Corby, Engagement Consultant at the ODI. And Stephen? Uh, Stephen with Phil from GLL. Thank you, Stephen. And finally, Andy. Uh, Andy Gordon, Senior Product Owner at Gladstone. Okay, thank you very much. And I am Timothy Hill, a uh, principal technologist with the Open Data Institute. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen here. Um, so the purpose of this call is really to gather feedback um, on the draft of the customer accounts API. Um, in particular from Gladstone. Uh, we've had a couple of weeks to look at it and, and review. So I'm just going to throw the floor open for comments, really, uh, for people to raise concerns. Well, from a Gladstone perspective, um, I think we're reasonably comfortable with the, the specification. Um, we've got questions, a question, if you like, that's maybe even pertinent probably more for our implementation rather generically but it's in the line of um <clears throat> how we, we can see from the booking spec which i know this is in the content at the moment from the booking specification that it can deal with a number of brokers because there's an identified site the broker shares the data to go through the booking process you come in as a particular customer at a particular site you make the booking on that site the question we've got here in this instance is whilst we've got the manchester project and another project as well um, away from Manchester is maybe we, we're skipping over it, we're not seeing the detail, but um, a concept of how this would work in a multi broker environment, being able to identify a, uh, a customer is joining from one broker, going into a central database being everyone active, and another broker having another member coming in, and how that's identified to then also come in. Internally, for using MWS, our, our uh, member web services, API, we, we need to be able to pass what we call a site where they belong to, their preferred booking site, if you like, as part of the, the input process. And that's an internal thing, but I think for us, there's two parts to this, is that are we missing something in the specification that deals with multiple brokers and how the communication is being handled there? But secondly, as well, from the user interface within the broker side which we have no exposure to really um is there a concept that they are either joining a uh, a membership scheme site is irrelevant or is it within the the ui side of things they identify a preferred site or the site they're joining and that could be used to pass through the um the, the customer account experience that then we capture and make sure the the database at the seller's end knows which site they implicitly belong to as such. Does that make sense? It could be a similar conversation, um, uh, discussion also point from, from Stephen from Greenwich as well, because they've got multiple sites and potentially multiple brokers as well. Just, just oh, sorry, comment this... on that. From... Sorry, Tim. Just oh, no, sorry, on continue on, Stephen. I'm actually not entirely clear on what Phil's uh, issue is, but maybe if you comment, I'll start to understand. Andy. Yeah, I, I think Andy makes a very good point, but I, I, I don't, I, in our particular instance in Manchester, I don't think that's relevant. And I'll tell, explain the reason why I don't think it's relevant. And that is because um, regardless of the, 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 the broker, and there's only one broker in this instance in the Manchester, um, the, 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 the customer ends up in the uh, LMS database as a, um, what would be consi considered at the lowest level membership you can take. <clears throat> so therefore, it doesn't matter which location I've allocated to, it has no bearing on their use. Um, there will be allowed cross-partnership use with that base level membership. 
Um, and therefore, if they're all attributed to one location or spread out evenly across all 19 locations, it makes no difference to us whatsoever. In this particular user case, <laughs> maybe different, different in other user cases. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, okay, so I think, well, maybe to, um, for, for, for Tim or anyone else's benefit, I'll, I'll, I'll play back what I think the two, sounds like two, two things. How does multiple brokers work? Where's that in the spec? And what about sites and where are sites and, and can the sites be, be spec? Be um, when someone, when a new account is created, can a site be specified for that new account? Um, I mean, to, to a certain extent on the second part of that, Nick, that's not really an issue. That's more of a question maybe with us, with the EA, which site would they want to be attributed if it's coming from Manchester or a different broker? Right. That, that's not a problem, but it's just, it, it was just nice to know if there is a concept of a site location identifier at the broker side that could be used. Otherwise, we go back to plan A as such, if that makes sense, and we'll deal with it internally. So yep. the, main, the main question is, how is this spec designed to work for multiple brokers? Okay. Okay. So should we, should we take that one first then? then, then I think so. Yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. sure. Yeah. So um, it's a really, really good point because I'm just looking through and it's not obvious from the way the specs laid out uh where that so it would be nice to have a little section potentially in here which is just explaining uh the the the, the bits are there but then it's not a kind of coherent summary that says the question basically that, that answers the question so um the probably the closest place to go to i think maybe start to explain it is the uh well is it is it even uh I think, well, yeah, okay. Maybe it's more implicit than it is explicit, in fact. So the idea, at least, uh, it's kind of implied by the use of Open uh, ID Connect, because that's how kind of Open ID Connect generally works, but it's not written in here as like, therefore we're, you know, that's how it usually works, therefore that's how it will work here. It's kind of implied that that's the case. And the implication is um, that the um, client ID, which is what you give someone as an open ID connect uh, kind of um, token to use. So um, the to, to make open ID connect work at all, the first thing you need to do is get the find the what's called a secret uh, and a client ID um, to the broker. So the the booking system or the seller needs to get those two effectively API keys, client ID and secret, and then somehow securely communicate them to the broker um, so that they can use those. Um, and they use those then to log in and do all the things that they're in the spec, you know, going through the flows, etc. cetera. Um, and so what's implicit in that is that when those are allocated, they're allocated to a broker specifically. So they're not generic keys. They're, you know, that that is just for uh, the Manchester project or for uh, Decathlon or whoever the broker is. And so, because they've got uh, that specific, um, because they because they only use those keys, uh, therefore you uh, the booking system is able to say, well, that's this broker, um, who's well, or, or yeah, well, exactly that. This broker is the one that's coming through. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, if there's any kind of configuration to do that's per broker that's necessary in the booking system, that is, um, that are, or, or, you know, the broker can allocate it to the keys or something like that. Um, and so there's not many other assumptions in here about, um, what that, um, what that means further on. I think maybe maybe an interesting thing uh, is that the concept for broker in the spec is actually slightly different to the authenticated party. So the authenticated party in the booking spec is the um, person that has the keys. And the person that has the keys in theory can use those keys for multiple brokers. Um, so I think that probably, that probably translates here. It's just that when it says you will provide access from such and such to such and such, um, that access is being provided to the authenticated party rather than to the broker. 
Um, and the authenticated party might be the broker. It might not be, depends on the situation. Um, so that's probably also just fine. Um, so it's kind of not tying the broker as named uh, in the in the kind of C1, C2 responses to the uh, keys because they're different and, and just kind of treating them separately. So the broker that comes through in the C1, C2 responses is there for analytics and for understanding the front ends that are being used and, and, and whatever else and the ones that are coming through and the information provided with the key as a, the key that's allocated um, that can be used for access control uh, and and that type of thing so the things okay. that um, yeah okay how does that yeah. sound yeah that sort of nails down i think what we were assuming but we just wanted to make sure that we hadn't made a silly assumption yeah. that's it, no i think that, that um, if, it, if that if that can be captured and documented in here as a reference point i think that would be good you know if, if we were to give this to a, a third party to help us out with the all two and that sort of thing as well then it's all yeah. in one one place yeah that's that's yeah that sounds like a really good idea um yeah hi debbie so debbie i think was on um a previous notes from a, a different zoom meeting so i've just shared oh, it with a, a new oh. link brilliant I also joined one yesterday and there was nobody on there. Did anything take place yesterday? I got a note from Andrew saying apparently being cancelled because it was still in my diary. I didn't get the cancellation note myself. Hmm. I, I'd still got it in my diary, but there's yeah, I didn't get any cancellation. Okay, something's gone awry then. <laughs> yeah, there was a... I did cancel and I, I did indicate that an automated note should be sent out. But um, yeah, I feel like we've got some phantom entries in people's diaries. Um, Phase five, number one task. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so like say, recreate everything. Recreate everything, yeah. Um, yeah, Debbie, Debbie, you haven't missed much. Uh, the question that I was just um, asking uh, the group here, and, and Nick was answering, was um, we're, we're fairly comfortable with the specification at this moment in time, um, but we had some questions around the uh, identifying multiple brokers coming in through the customer account how we'd be able to identify if it was coming from Manchester or a different broker or a third broker, however this rolled out. Uh, and Nick was just going through um, the method which he was um, being proposed through all to, um, so that's gonna be added to the, the specification as, as an update. Uh, but I think from what Phil and I are saying is that it seems comfortable. Um, so that, that's really where we are at the minute, fairly early on. Okay. So yeah, so it's just a question of expanding the guidance slightly about the implications of the authentication method used. Um, okay. Um, I guess the, the, there was the second part of the question. I didn't know whether Nick was going to be able to carry yeah. on or whether we needed to explain it yeah, a little so, bit more from a Gladstone perspective. Yeah, so as, as Debbie's on the call, I don't want to put Debbie sort of on the spot. It's maybe a question for outside of this, but just a sort of a headline, just to Debbie's benefit, which I mentioned earlier. So communication coming from a broker um i was asking the question whether within the broker's portal whether there was any means or any scope of a site being captured that could be used to pass through the authentication to then create the member uh if it isn't a concept that it's we know that it's an organization coming in from one two three or different brokers if there's no site or relevant to them it means nothing to them because they're joining their membership scheme that's uh county district uh council wide um we need to look at something probably talking with yourselves with regards to maybe within uh, the data manager an example how that if it comes in from broker manchester which site we want to be attributed with regards to the uh, create calls for a member account and likewise if it came from a different other broker from another side um would it go to a central um, site ID or would it go to a default site or site specifics? I, I don't know whether we can capture that from the portal, but it's just an identify so that we don't put all these members into one big bucket for all brokers or whether it needs to be split to individual um, member re member buckets for their re relevant ranges. I feel like we've already had this conversation, if I'm honest, and I thought we'd got to the conclusion where there would be one site associated for each contract rather than an association for uh, like a list of sites within the contract and I thought we were looking at putting it somewhere in if 
um, if the um, current Gladstone interface that I use for open data is um, where we're looking to put all of this, I thought that was one of those elements that was going in there where you create the, when you create the broker, you say what site so is it, is that broker is for, if that makes sense. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. We, we, we just had that concept of a broker yeah. could potentially target multiple sites and we just wanted to double check to see if there was a way that they could choose a site from the broker portal or yeah. whether we were just going to put it into a, a default site for that broker connection. Which sounds like we would do within the data manager, a mapping type thing. Yep. Yep. So the broker would go to a site. Yeah. As long as there's no expectation from the client's perspective to try and break when it, you know, when it comes to adding subscriptions and stuff like that for their discounts, as mm -hmm. long as there's no expectation that they want to know exactly which center that person wants to be associated with. And they're in agreement that it's a contract wide yep. membership that you know, allows usage at all of the facilities within that contract, then I, I feel like that's the easiest solution. Oh, yeah, completely, completely, completely agree. Easiest, think, yeah. Uh, yeah, completely agree. Uh, Phil says definitely the easiest. It was just mm. more of a concept. What was the user interface from the um, broker's perspective, whether yeah. that was an offer or not? And it sounds yeah. like it's probably not, but that's maybe a conversation with the relevant brokers. Yeah, I guess within the interface, we'd we'd need to somehow present to the user. If you take it, if you look at Westminster, for example, it's a it's not a small place, is it? But you'd want to almost be able to explain to the user what what centres are available as part of the thing that they're signing up, whatever that is, um, but not necessarily allow them to select their preferred centre. Just say that this is this is this is what you get if you know what I mean this is yeah. this is part of your package but that will come down to the to the design I mm. suppose yeah and, and I think that that'll be down to how we do it with the data manager so with the data manager it'll come in through the site it will be able to specify the site according to the broker and then we, we as we've discussed before how the mapping works from the the, the the discount types if you like from the broker how that's mapped through to membership types within the integration and how that's assigned to the member and those sorts of things so mm. yeah that, yeah I knew it was sort of an internal question, but it's just whether there was a concept of site recognition or anything at all from the broker's piece. That's a bit we don't see, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, that answers, I think, um, Nick. Not a problem with Ensure from our perspective, more more so with um, for, for GLL, I think, but um, we've just got the one, the Manchester, but yeah, Westminster's bigger. Yeah. That, that, that sounds good. It's certainly the simplest solution if that if that works. Um, yeah, I guess it's a, it's it's a question of future. I, I suppose with all with all this, it's just trying to figure out where the line we draw is in terms of functionality um, to you know not not include things that are you know. Um, yeah, we just want to keep it as generic as possible. So, yeah, you know, it's a one for all. Yeah. If you so, go, sorry, just, sorry, so just just from my own understanding. Um, so the general conclusion is because of the authentication method, you've got information about which broker is connecting. And then from that information, you just assign a default location based on that broker. The logic is as simple as that. Yeah, um, yeah. And then it's on the back end system to make sure that that doesn't interfere with internal consistency. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, great. And um, maybe it's a, I don't know, is it a caveat to explain to brokers that there can't be multiple centers associated to a broker and therefore there can't be differences for when it comes to um what's on offer within the memberships if that makes when it comes to you know assigning memberships to individuals at that stage um we can't have a variation between the permissions from one site to another the permissions would be the same um for everybody that joined for that broker Maybe it's just something to, to caveat mm. in the document. I don't know. That is interesting. That's the right place. So if there's if there's an, a future case where uh, people might want to have a I don't know like a, like a, a swimming membership for the aquatic centre that only matters for that or something. Um, well, I was thinking more like within within Westminster, if they set, turn around to us and say they want one site to allow access to this this and this but if you join at another site you get access to this this and this and those two things are different 
Um, I don't think that would be an option because if we're only creating one centre for one broker, that mm. means in theory it's one subscription for one broker. Yeah. Not not saying there'll only be could, there could be variations of subscriptions. It could be an adult and a concession and <clears throat> a yeah. all of that. But um, the permissions for that membership within within MRM's world apply to everybody regardless. Not 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 different from one site to another within the contract area for that broker. I'm just thinking about, um, yeah, we, yeah, I see what you mean. We might get unstuck later if something comes up that, that where they're like, can you not do this? And they're like, oh, well, actually, time to talk about that would have been six months ago. Um, mm. uh, do, um, I mean, we, 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 what we, we could add, something optional in the spec that allows for people to define the place when they create an account um i suppose it's a weird inconsistency isn't it because some maybe that will be useful for some systems more than it will be for others but um if it's the case that i mean is it the case that at the higher levels because i think stephen was saying um before you joined there, there debbie that the basic level it doesn't matter because for the free stuff you, you just get the same membership everywhere um but for the for the high levels, well, I guess they're still free, aren't they? Um, but at least, uh, is it? Are we are we are we cutting ourselves um, a problem for later here by uh, by not including that as an optional feature? I guess I think, I think it's more of a question whether the what the leisure provider is providing as a service is it a generic package that rolls out across all the services, all the sites, or would there ever be an instance whereby one site had slightly higher privileges? Than all the others it seems a bit rare to me but i'm not the one negotiating contracts and the services that they're offering under that le leisure contract well so i think I th i'm just thinking about the way this um the mapping works so i think the the current way this is structured is the broker doesn't have any kind of idea about those internals and it won't have any idea about what's available where either because the the uh, membership is a broker membership that the mm -hmm. Um, seller is effectively servicing mm -hmm. so the brokers and the broker saying that you know it's a junior resident for example um, and it's the seller who's then going okay well that means this in this context and this in this context and so it, um, I'm, in terms of the way the spec is currently that that framing it's a uh, if there are multiple th options at different places then that's almost up to the um seller to map if there's a different price or a different something uh, that they get if if you know that if, it, if, it, if it's a different price that's shared across multiple sites then i don't perceive that being a problem but if it's a site or a couple of sites that want to work slightly differently there's a potential going to hate me for saying this there's a potential you could create further subscriptions but that would need to be mapped to specific offers driven by the broker to indicate this gives them a higher privilege yeah so okay i think so i was just so i was just trying to assess in my head the complexity of what we're talking about and i think it's probably actually is quite complicated because we would need to then there would need to be a mechanism to somehow uh share um what's available where so that you can only you know book the things in the right places and then those memberships as they're currently um shared will need to be yeah um well it doesn't it doesn't yeah it doesn't fit the paradigm i think that's the challenge yeah. to, to me it's more of a case if it's a user case is it an edge case is it mm -hmm. going to provide value that we need to consider right here and now and benefit or is it something that if it were to arise that's a discussion that could happen at the time and then decide you know what value would it bring over and above the current specification we have at the moment yeah so as far as i'm aware it's not in the mcr or westminster requirements right now so that might be that might be the so answer we must be doing something um which determines which broker has access to make bookings at which sites so there must be an association between the broker and sites in that way uh yeah uh that's right that's perfect so, that. so the brokers have the brokers have global entitlements that they can apply to the booking system to the seller so if, if, if you're a broker and you've been given permission to book, 
then as that broker, you can also say and apply this entitlement. As it stands with the open data at the moment, is that what in theory is being pushed out from, correct me if I'm wrong here, Phil and Debbie, but the way that the open data works and then with regard to applying the booking availability, <clears throat> so from an EA perspective, all booking availability is basically put into the cloud. It's all, and then it's down to the actual broker to pass to the site that they're, in, that they're of interest of their contract. We're not just passing through, let's say, Manchester's bookings. It's everything. Yeah, no, I understand that. But I thought that when we talked about this before, we talked about being able to control in some way which brokers had access to which activities at which centres. So not at an activity level, but at a centre level. So there's got to be some control in place there to be able to say that they can... Um, that we will accept bookings from that broker for centre yeah. one, two or three, but not five, six or seven. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so therefore you've got to create some sort of association between the broker and the centres, not necessarily the, the open data, because yes, everybody can see the open data, but when it comes to making bookings or assigning entitlements, it, can, it only should be happening for that subset of centres for that broker. I think that might be one of those areas which is a... Um, the 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 access the access control in the booking spec is a is at the seller level rather than at the um, rather than at the site or the or the opportunity level. So if you've got access to book for a seller, that you in theory could book anything, but obviously there's a contract in place to make sure that and you can terminate if the if the seller if the broker starts booking things they shouldn't be booking, that's going to be very obvious to everyone in that. Obviously, result in termination of their uh, um, agreements or uh, you know connections um, because it's not they're not um, by making bookings. There's no uh, GDPR risk or anything. You know, there's no legal, there's no um, data protection requirements uh, that are there. So it's purely about um, the, it would be purely about um, asserting their. Um, their contract that they're, they're complying with the contract that they've got, which would also be visible because all the obviously all the payments that are coming through uh, are all reconciled. So if those payment reports something's being booked that's not the one that should be booked, I mean that that will be cap that will be um, captured. So um, so for simplicity, that's why. So it, it makes it it makes it simpler uh, to um, put the access control at the seller level um, to 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 make the thing. Um, easier, I suppose. So that'd be just, a, I guess it's if that works, which I guess it's the question of, you know, are we happy with that idea of, you know, if a broker goes rogue, there's a few ways they could go rogue. I mean, this is one of them, right? There's a few ways they could go rogue. They could pay, they could start booking things and not transferring money for it. They could do all sorts of things. Um, but if a broker starts going rogue, then there needs to be a process operationally in place that says, you know, you're supposed to be booking this stuff at this price and paying us this money, which is what the reconciliation process is, and you haven't. Therefore, <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, uh, what's you know what 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 what, what to do about that situation? Um, but I, I suspect it might be, um, but it might it might be a, a a simpler and therefore cheaper approach to put that in the operational reconciliation part. Um, and obviously, it should never happen because that would be very bad faith for the broker um i might i might be misunderstanding the question here but is debbie asking they've got the data they've got access to data they're pulling the data out from that particular site but if there's i don't know 10 sites worth of data there but they only want to offer four of them mm -hmm. there's a booking process is that not in the control of the broker in the ui and what they're displaying and are offering yeah yeah absolutely yeah the, yeah broker can restrict the broker can refine it down to whatever they care yeah. about. But because access is it... control and that sort of thing is, is too late. Does that make sense? Yeah. What's offered through the, the UI from the broker's portal that interfaces then into the booking system? Yeah, that's, I guess, what I was saying about access control. Because, you, yes, to view access control properly here would be quite a complicated piece. Um, and there's a lot of implications at lots of different stages in the process to do that because as you say it's open data there's lots of aggregation involved and all the rest of it so to to make um access control effective is quite complicated therefore the current solution to that is to 
solve it via contracts, basically make sure everyone's doing what they should be doing and, and, and ensure there's really good audit to make sure everyone can, can check that. Mm, I'm putting my Dave head on and saying, um, the manual audit approach is not the right approach mm -hmm. and that we should be able to somehow, and he, he says it, you know, with the, the current Gladstone APIs, we should be able to lock them down mm -hmm. so that the users for those APIs can only access the relevant stuff for that, for that person. So I don't know, I am, um, it feels to me like that we should be able to do something when it comes to the point of bookings and adding offers and stuff like that and entitlements to people, restricting those instances to a particular broker. Not the exposure of the data, I get that, that's, that, that's not going to be limited because that's just out there. So but, but certainly the applying bookings and memberships and, and amending member records and all of that sort of stuff as well. Like we don't just want them going in and dialing and updating member records that are not relevant to that. Okay. To that so, broker. There's a so there's a consideration there you wanted to take in providing some form of authentication down to a site level of what a broker could do. Could we press on that a bit and just check, just check it through? Uh, just, I mean, so I, I agree, Debbie. That sounds like I totally see Dave, Dave's hat. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's fine. It's good. I mean, so, so if we push on that a little bit, just to check that um, the mitigations we already have in place are not sufficient. So, on each of those points, and if if it seems that they're not, then you know it sounds like we've got a gap there. But just to check that, because I think, um, so. The mitigations for the problem, so, you know, editing user data in other sites, um, this whole thing, the, the, the specification is built around an individual consent model. Um, so the only people that can, the only data that can ever be edited is data that the user is explicitly consented to. So they'll have to have logged in, you know, the username and password to do that. Um, so unlike the Gladstone API, which I agree is, that's a, yeah, that's a different problem because you can, access all the data for all the members, all the places. And there's a real good reason why that should be locked down from a GDPR perspective. Um, whereas the, the approach this takes is, is a, um, it's kind of authenticated per person. Um, so there isn't like the access that the broker has in this case, shouldn't have any detriment to the seller because there's no um, like carte blanche doing stuff um, that has the same kind of implications potentially. Um, so I guess I guess is is it a um I'm trying to think like what's the um it, maybe it's worth thinking about like some use cases where um we worry that there might be a, a problem and then just checking that you know what what mitigations we have for that. Um, I guess if a member wants to change their own data, then that's going to be coming in with their open um, open ID specific to that member, which will be contained within the broker request. So we'll be able to authenticate to make sure that the broker has requested data to be changed for someone whose open ID is linked to that broker in some way. Uh, well, uh, I guess... So the, the way that the way this works online um, with um, kind of like, you, you know, you, um, organizations where you've got like a, a login to someone else's thing is if the, if the, if the customers, if the customer logs in with their own email address and password and says, can I do this thing? Mm -hmm. um, then they generally can do the thing. Yeah. Um, so and in this is a specific example, I suppose it would be logging into Westminster, for example, with an account that maybe isn't from Westminster. Maybe they, you know, created an account in Cardiff. Mm -hmm. Maybe they drove drove to Westminster and got an active Westminster card, and then logged in with their credentials. Um, but in in most of those cases, um, again, my understanding is that the databases are he here are usually global. That you can log in anywhere and access anything. So. Did you see what I mean? Like where? So so where's the restriction there? So that if the if the user comes from Cardiff and goes to Westminster, what are we expecting them not to be able to do because they've got an account they got from Cardiff? My guess would be that if they've registered with Cardiff and they have Cardiff entitlements, they shouldn't be able to make any bookings using those entitlements against another 
site that's outside of the Cardiff contract. That's right. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's, that's how it works. The fundamental part of it, and that. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, that's that's definitely that's how it works at the moment. Yeah. So they won't they won't be able to do anything. They won't be able to make any. Um, because, and and because that's simply because those entitlement IDs are not going to be mapped to um, anything that's in Westminster. But also, I guess the fear would be that broker A, yes, they have all of their entitlements, but the the um, availability feeds, they could pick stuff out of that that's to do with a site that's not relevant to that broker. Mm -hmm. They could then potentially choose something to book from that that is not within the scope of the contract. Mm -hmm. Would you deem that as being allowable or would that be down to, as you say, your manual audit type stuff? So the the they won't they won't be able to book anything other than the basic price, because mm -hmm. there won't be any allocation at that that other site won't have those those um, entitlement IDs mapped. Yeah, your offers won't have any entitlement IDs in them, so you'll just see the guest offer option. Yeah, I'm just thinking more of the fact that someone potentially could go and make a whole load of bookings to sites that they're not doing anything with, take all the money for it, and um in theory that should be things that they shouldn't be taking money for or making any money on or doing anything with because they're not entitled to do anything with a site outside of their contract yes so that's the, exactly that so that's right so that so so people can't make any bookings on memberships that they like the membership is it's not it's not whether they can misuse the membership because that's mm -hmm. all set it's whether there's the, the the nefarious possibility here is someone can um make a booking where they're not supposed to make a booking at the appropriate price they'll have mm -hmm. to pay the appropriate price they won't be able to do something yeah. that isn't the right price but they the, the, but someone in the api could make a booking and then not not take the money for it mm -hmm. uh, anywhere but that that and so that is the reconciliation problem so someone can make a booking and not take the money for it and that is the problem you've got with any any kind of api integration because there's no yeah. Uh, unless we get the bank, you know, in, 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 unless we get proper payment integration in the in the spec at a real core level here, and, and that's a very complicated thing. Um, it, that's not a thing that's well it, within our integration. That's not going to be possible because we're not actually making the booking until the very end when payment is actually confirmed. Well, so. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so, but that's a, that's a whole different that's a whole different oh, yeah. Time. Yeah. and a different type of assurance as well. Because, um, but I suppose that's where that's where the reconciliation is important and. Um, if the reconciliation and I, and I imagine, well, I guess this question for the operators really, but I imagine in cases where they've already got contracts in place with a kind of a, a gym pass or a move TV or things like that, there's a reconciliation process that happens and commercial teams have to be happy that the money gets get, that gets paid is the money that comes in and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I wonder whether that kind of the bucket of problem that's access control is kind of separate from the bucket of problem, which is reconciliation. Um, and I think I think we might have the, the access control here might be the level that it needs to be what from what I've understood of um, what we're saying. It's just that the reconciliation is obviously a, is a thing. It, it could be as well at our implementation time. I think like Debbie said, she'd like it. So maybe a certain broker can only do things that are relevant to a certain set of sites. Mm. It may well be it'll be something that we'd need to implement on the seller side behind the scenes rather than being exposed through the broker and stuff so the broker would be able to attempt to do whatever they want to do and then we would do the blocking at the moment of yeah. we're potential not control, violation we're not, of contract because we're not in control with regards to what they're actually passing through the open data feed and then what in theory they're offering is at the point of a handshake to try and make the booking yeah so i think we'd be doing that does that sound about right debbie the fact that we would we would be act as the gateway for the sites of which a contract could do actions against things it feels like we do need something like that i don't i don't yeah. mean to be a pain in the bum or anything like that i just mm -hmm. i think that's what dave would say um he'd definitely <laughs> not want the the fallback to be well if it doesn't reconcile then you deal with it there it, it, that's just not an approach you'd okay. want to take cause it's very manual yeah. isn't it and um, yeah. it's just something else for accounts to deal with we don't we don't want to introduce more manual processes where possible so yeah. Um, if we just need to figure out 
what that looks like um i guess yeah. so if if that customer is it, they're a uh, they're, they're logged into the westminster broker system um and somehow they try and book an activity that's outside of those centers mm-hmm. um they're gonna get told no Accept not through order. Yeah, yeah. that's with the broker system um but then give them an alternative route somehow to book make that yeah. booking which means coming over to ea and that that would Just signing in properly easy. yeah it's sound, I did, as we're talking more and more about this it definitely sounds it's something that we would be doing on the seller portal mm-hmm. side yeah. of doing some form of gateway control of saying what broker can do actions against a certain set of sites within that contract so it's yeah. like it's like a whitelist isn't it you basically against your yes your id for the uh the, against the client id in secret that you're you've got allocated you would have a whitelist of sites that they that that client id in secret can book yes i think so i think that's probably something we would work on implementing on our side debbie okay and if it's done as a simple whitelist, that shouldn't add too much to the, this is in the back of my mind. I'm like, keep the cost and complexity low because, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if, if it's just a simple whitelist, like that could be configured in. Yeah. That could be quite simple. Weak. Yeah. Probably sort it? something out for that. And it doesn't even necessarily like, I guess it could go in AWS, couldn't it? But I was just thinking like, it doesn't, wherever those client IDs and secrets are basically being created, it could just go along that with that. As a... There'll be some, we'll have something that's sat behind a broker registration that gives a list of things that are relevant to that broker, yeah. which might be their um, API credentials so that that can be tracked as well. And also maybe the list of things that they are or areas they're allowed to play with. Sure. So yeah, as, I think the, the key thing there is to, um, keep in mind with the design that as you said that's going to only flag an error message at the very end of the process Mm -hmm. so it it really is is a kind of last line of defense access control in a kind of security sense or a you know like you say it's not it's not a uh like as debbie i know you were saying about like diverting into the everyone active website that if that was the idea that would probably be better done in a different way like talking to the brokers directly and telling them that um rather than this this api doing that as a way of um this is really just like a computer says no you know i mean in in theory i guess as long as the broker is playing the game well then they'll never hit they'll never hit a blocker exactly that's it. only when they start deviating from plan that this might catch them out yeah yeah exactly i mean within within their portal they need to know clear verbatim from the open date feed what they offer what they don't offer yeah it it also gives the ultimate control to the seller yeah but when it comes to actually making the bookings or adding an account that's where we defend ourselves with regard to when the doors open and when the doors closed there's two parts to it what's shown in their ui versus what they can actually do to interact into that data set the only the only consideration i'm just thinking although just in terms of complexity is that that whitelist, if you were if you were going to allow a broker to book all sites, which was quite big. Um, so. If it was all sites, we'd probably just leave it. If it was empty, it. then there would be no block. But if there's more, okay. one or more, then it has to be in the list. Yeah. So like this is for like the, the brokers that are less trusted or whatever, that you can start them off with a couple sites to see how they go and not it's, worry about the audit i mean i have no idea what the potential contracts are but that could be there it's just a way a mechanism of allowing the seller to have the knowledge that they have got the control to stop the broker sure. playing silly buggers yeah i mean it, 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 you know with, with a with a customer nick as an example i don't know not in city council they've got a series of sites that's the only sites that they know this is more dealing with the customers like PLL, Fusion, everyone active, whereby they they manage multiple contracts. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't roll it out verbatim across the whole of the estate. It'll be broken by broker if there's a, if there's a need. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, so yeah, I, I, I you had to. I, sorry, I had to do the necessary thing of pushing back against more complexity because every time we grow the scope a little bit. Agreed. Then, uh... Oh yeah, agreed. Agreed. <laughs> but um, sounds like it might be necessary. Um, 
although maybe uh, maybe small. So we, we can add, an, uh, I think what, what is needed in the spec actually there is probably an appropriate error message that can be returned. Yeah, some some form of structured message with Access to some sensible detail that we can put in to say, sorry, you can't book at this site, please go and review. Yeah, and that's the sort of message you would, somewhere or yeah, something like that. that. I don't know. That's the sort of message we would speak, and uh, it could be customizable within our data manager that the wording would be agreed by um, everyone active. Well, so I'd actually suggest to keep, keep the complexity simple here that we make this error message just a stock error that's just access denied. Because, like you say, this should be happening at the very edges of possibility. We should never have to, you know, this isn't this this is something that that when uh, let's say Debbie and uh, you know team talks to new broker that's integrating they say you will only book on these two sites and the broker goes yes we will you know if they see access denied um should be quite obvious to them why <laughs> um so that, just just in terms of keeping it simple um potentially do you think or i guess it's just considering at what point they see that as well because you said a minute ago that that's that the, the booking's made at the very last stage only so if, if that message comes up after payment's been made, then that might be a problem. So it's understanding well, they need to, they, they, Yeah, I mean, I suppose they need to get through the door first of all. Um, so they've identified themselves. The question would be how we manage that from a guest perspective. My guess would be, though, that when the, when the booking is attempted from what we're intending on doing, the only thing that will have been done on the payment side is a pre-auth. And it's only when a successful response comes back from the booking request via the C1, C2, I forget which one it is, or P, or we, I can't remember the request name it is. But when that request goes back and it's successful, it's only at that point yeah. that the broker will actually then say that pre-auth is a go or that pre-auth is cancelled. So I think we probably, right? want to, we probably want this error to be at C1, C2 and B. So Possibly, yeah. So, so therefore, they don't even get. So, actually, rather than it being right at the end, yeah, you're right. It, it better to tell them as soon as possible. That they're trying yeah, to do it and because we don't have leasing, we I don't think we're going to have the C1 and C2. We only yeah. have that B record. I think you're, at C1 and C2, you'll still be returning a response, so you should be able to check the whitelist. The, 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 potentially, yes, yes. There may be a response that could come back from them, but yes, potentially C1, C2, or B. It's probably safer to potentially put the link in all of them, just in case. Yeah, I, um, I think because the other thing that's in the spec is that C2 and B. If C2 succeeds, B should succeed. In so, theory, yeah. So this, so we probably want to make sure that we fail C2 to ensure mm -hmm. that no one tries to make payment, like you say. Yeah, but. Sorry, just just a thing. Why why are we even letting them look at the availability stage at a site that they should be belonging to? I would have thought it would be even before the booking, before the even availability stage. Yeah, so C C one, so C one, C two, and B. I think. Do you mm -hmm. mean Andy from the availability that they garner from the availability feeds, or from? Because in theory, anyone can show anything from an availability feed. There is zero yeah, control yeah. over that. Yeah. The only okay. time we can ever say that we can't give them information is when they go and check availability on a specific instance uh, of a spe specific yeah. activity or a class. So if the call comes in asking for, is that class still available? Is that activity still available? That's when we whitelist it. Yeah, that's when we can confirm against the whitelist and we can tell them, no, you can't, you're no access yeah. allowed or whatever the generic message is that we may come up with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it needs to be done at that level even before anywhere going near the make booking. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. it. That's the get available. Yeah. Agreed. I know this has gone off subject subject now, really, from the customer accounts and the membership, hasn't it? Apologies for that. Well, in essence, it's the same thing for the customer accounts. We need to ensure that anyone who's, you know, is going in the customer account, we just need to make sure that that broker, you know, he, he, yeah, we are doing the mapping for the broker ID down to a specific site for the MWS call, but we need to make sure that we capture that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So just to just to revisit the question of of the nature of the error message, Nick, you said earlier that you felt that it should be fairly generic. Um, but actually, if we're if we're surfacing this fairly early in the process, wouldn't it make sense to have a more specific error message? So the reason I was saying that was because we're not we don't have any design in here for um basically we, we we want to avoid a situation where this feature gets used 
or misused, should I say, as a way of the of the only way the broker knows what what sites they can book is because this is being this feature is being used because that's going to create all problems for all kinds of problems for their user experience and etc. Um, so we, we we this this error message should really never be seen. This is your last line of defense, so that Dave's hat is happy. Um, Dave's hat specifically, um, because and, and that's important uh, to make sure people are comfortable with that. Obviously, but but I think that's the key. It's it's that's the reason it's there. It's not for informing users or um, anything like that, because that user informing piece should be done at the contract negotiation conversation right up front. So this is just about um, you know after the you know, everyone active and um, Decathlon have had a chat about what sites are going to be in scope for the summer campaign. They go, great, these sites, that gets put into AWS. Um, they crack on. But if their developers step out of line, they hit an error message. But they, that should never get to the point where that ends up on a live website. Yeah, that, that, should, be, that should be a UAT problem, you know, like yeah. way earlier in the process. Yeah, what, what it basically stops is then they have a rethink with regards to what's been offered through the portal. Take that site off the portal, basically. Don't, use, don't pass that data. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They, they they need to do the filtering on their end on the open data side to take the to take the site out. So we defended the gate with regards to making the booking. They need to then take that availability off their booking site because it's an inappropriate site. Yeah, I think this is where Tim was suggesting maybe a bit more of a an informational message saying rather than just access denied, saying unfortunately you're unable to book against this site or. Yeah, yeah, something that's a tad more those, descriptive. Yeah. It needs to be something being passed to the API rather than what in theory would be passed to the actual end user. That's right. If it, exactly, like a, a developer-friendly message that explains the, the yeah. reason for access yeah. denied. Yeah. You don't have permission. Site access denied or something. Don't speak to Debbie. Mm. <laughs> so I think possibly a generic access message with the, the description, something that could be set in the booking system, like a, a, like a hard-coded level. So, you know, for mm -hmm. Gladstone's use case, you could put access denied as the, the error type and then, you know, access denied because of a site um, violation or something uh, as, the, as the description. I mean, there, there, there could be two messages. There's one that's passed back for the incorrect use of the API call. But if there is a user interface, there's something that we, that could be, have some generic data, but could be controlled by the, uh, the seller to inform any, any users that an error has occurred. Well, I think would, that's... Would you res put that responsibility on the broker? No, no. What, we're, what we're saying is we've got, somehow they've offered the... They, they, they've found from the open data a site incorrectly. They offer that onto their website. So there's two parts mm -hmm. to it. The user is actually pressed a button of check availability. So there's two things. One, the developer, the broker needs to be told incorrect use of site. You don't have permission. But to the end user, rather than a termination, there needs to be something there that says to them, sorry, an error is concerned, please contact um, Manchester City Council or whatever the case may well be, because it's, it's an inappropriate choice. There's two parts to it in my mind, what goes behind the scenes and what the end user comes to. So I, think, I think the end user piece is probably for the broker, though, to, to define, do you think, rather than for the seller? It, it, in if, in if, my if head, it, I would say yeah. so. Okay, yeah, I agree with that because it's going back to them. They need to handle it from their end. Yeah, fine. Yeah. yeah. So, so maybe I suppose maybe there's a guidance piece there or something about if communicating with the end user mm. uh, at, at the most in this document. Uh, yeah, so I'm having it in C11 as, a, as an error, uh, as a comment on that error. So, um, so basically, a um, an access denied error for this is where a booking system might deny access, e.g., on a site that's high basis. So this idea that um, um, uh, sorry, it's just if you scroll up a little bit, Tim, it's, I've just commented at the top on the um, uh, heading there on the right. Yeah, right on the right hand side, that comment there. Yeah, exactly. So an access denied error for cases where. Um, um, I want, maybe should, should add to that a, a description can be used to inform the developer of the nature of the breach or the nature of the issue. So I think I think that that probably hits the requirements while keeping it as simple as possible. <laughs> Okay. Uh, 
reasonably elegant, I suppose. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's actually it's a really good point because there could be a number of reasons why access denied happens if, if this kind of check is in place, um, depending on the type of call being made. So, we have that capability. Okay, I think I think that has, I think that was great. An issue was identified and an issue was uh, more or less solved. Yay! Um, <laughs> are we so, sorry? Are we comfortable? With, is that definitely good? Uh, as in. It it reads okay to me as it stands at the moment. Yeah. Yep. And does it, Debbie? Does that work for Dave's hat, as it were? I think he would feel more comfortable. Yes. <laughs> we've just got to do our, we've just got to do something on our side with regards to providing the white listing and the access control. Um, I hate that we say an access control. It's just confusing. I know that's what confused me early on as well. But permission <laughs> control, if you like, then. Permission okay. control. Yeah. <laughs> Right, access is, yeah. in this sector has two meanings, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a broken 20, site. 20 plus years working in the industry, you know, access control means something completely different to what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I see what you mean. Actually, access denied could also sound like access control. Gosh, you can't come in the building. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Turn around and walk away. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> More guidance, access, what it means to uh, in this presentation. <laughs> we um, had that discussion before in the past, of course, confusion. But anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I felt like that, that got unpicked for, with a fairly clear resolution. Um, that was comment number one on uh, reactions <laughs> to the specification. <laughs> are, there, are there further comments or um, gaps that have been identified on the Gladstone side? Not that we can see at the moment. I mean, I think more will be un discovered, if you like, as we go through the implementation. And as we, you know, we get to the point of actually working through the development aspect, through the form of uh, triaging and deployments and testing to the point where we're ready to say, yep, EA are green to go um, type thing. So by far, you know, if the question like it did come up last time, can we sign this spec off? The feeling at the moment is no, it would be part of the implement, a successful implementation and lessons learned, I think, through this process. Okay, so there's nothing blocking you in this spec right now from attempting to, to implement, right? Not okay. at all. Not at all. It was just those questions around the brokers and, mm -hmm. as we're saying there, the, uh, the permissions and so on. That's great. That's the best I think we probably could hope for is happy enough to implement. Yeah, because um, yeah. Yeah, um, totally... Uh, I suppose the question is whether we we we, we push this into a kind of formal CR state, uh, kind of state, so implementers uh, kind of comfortable that with it with it not kind of changing with like random in random ways, and then um, a bit like we have with booking the booking spec CR three is that there are changes on top of CR three obviously, and that have happened since the spec is published, but they're generally amendments and they're minor rather than you know let's just rip out this whole section. So I, I guess if we're if we're comfortable with uh, this being broadly correct, as in we don't expect a whole section to be ripped out. Probably the, in the, the one thing I would say from a documentation perspective, it's just maybe being me. Um, I don't know how other people feel. If amendments do happen within the specification at any point, is there anywhere that at the top of the document, the base of the document, there is last updated by what section, like an audit trace? Mm -hmm. At the moment, I think what we've seen historically is that things have changed and it suddenly comes out of the blue. Oh, this changed, that changed. And if you're looking for words, it's not clear. There needs to, be, there needs to be something somewhere on there that says specs, whatever it is, dot well, one, two, three, whatever it is, amended by section what it was. So, so that we, we get that when we put it into like a, the, the formal um document if you like the html document because the problem with the google doc is you <laughs> you're just like editing words you know i'll just delete this and change that it, um, even in that it's difficult it has been proven to be difficult to get the get, track the changes that have occurred because it's words down the right hand side and unless you start from stop and all the way to the bottom you know all it, if it's manual it's just taking the casting on it misses something but even yeah. in the google document something at the top just a simple entry say date time who by section what changed would have all the uh, the reads of a document going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's also a question about 
I would like to get it into a formal um, respec um, format, uh, partly to get that kind of change log um, functionality, um, and all, and to give some reassurance about its stability. Um, I'm actually not too sure what status it should have as a document, though, because it's it doesn't feel like we should be folding it into um, Open Booking API CR3. <sighs> Um, no, so it's going to exist as a separate sort of module on the side. And I'm actually not too sure what you call that. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of optional extension, um, but I'm not too sure what the formal mechanism for that it, is. It seems, be, it, seems, well, it, seems, well, it seems to be this custom account, isn't it? The adding, editing, modifying, whatever you want to put on it. Uh, yeah, I, th I think it might be just its own specification with a dependency yeah, from yeah. booking spec. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just with its own version numbering and its own release cycle. Um, yeah. Ooh, version numbering. That's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> and there, there is a section. Oh, I say this. Is there a section? It's not yet a section. Mm. And you'll add a section because I, okay, I thought. Okay, there we go. Okay, there's a, there, there should be a section on this. Uh, oh, no, there is. Oh, A2, uh, the top of the spec. Although you're not sharing your screen, so um, uh, seamless, brilliant. Uh, yes, that's right. Right. Well, yeah. What I, I think. Um, hmm. Do you mean, Tim, more the versioning of this document rather yeah. than any relationship to? other versions of documents this depends on yes and how we how we coordinate those if coordination is desired that you know if you if you change one of them if you update one of them um how do you relate that to yeah how do you cross reference and so forth yeah um, yeah so there's kind of a dependency tree that we've got at the minute which is this um yeah this is <laughs> so it's the subject of like a really really long discussion a while ago um because like I think I think at the time I was pushing for one version, you know, one number yes. across the whole of Open Active, uh, and um, uh, there was some quite strong pushback against that. And I I, I think I agree with it, um, which uh, which is that that makes that makes it difficult for things to evolve at their own paces. Yeah. Um, and, and so the idea of this dependency tree, which is a little bit like a development, you know, the library dependency tree, really, um, you know the 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 order here is the booking spec depends on the modeling spec, the modeling spec depends on the RPD spec, um, the booking spec depends on the RPD spec, and this new spec will depend on all, all, all three of those. And so if there's an update to um, a, a one further down, then that will need to be accommodated by an update to one further up, like you would with a, a library dependency. So you, for example, if, if someone changes RPDE, then we'll need to bump the number of, um, the customer accounts API to work with that. Um, but that the idea there is that if if we do change RPD to version two, that's actually going to break a whole bunch of stuff um, because it's quite fundamental level of uh, stuff. So there shouldn't be an automatic expectation that if that gets changed, that everyone then adopts it across all the different types of implementations immediately. Um, and, and therefore having it built in uh, the, the, the dependency as it would be with libraries solve that problem a little bit more um and and therefore we we then potentially would release this as uh you know customer accounts api version one cr or something um yeah let's let's do that for the moment i mean i feel like there are different philosophies of api versioning and maybe we need to do some review of that um can I have the argument again i love it yeah we should um one version <laughs> Well, no, I don't. I don't think I'd necessarily propose that, but I. I, yeah, I feel like there could be branching complexities here um, that could get could get ugly. Um, not right now. I'm not worried about that as a sort of immediate concern, but I think in the sort of intermediate future, um, you can imagine. Um, yeah, uh, a changing a change to the opportunity spec. Um, you know, for instance, having knock on effects on which versions of Open Booking API are using blah 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 blah. Well, so uh, that's interesting. So that's what the the, the, the sentence at the bottom um, talked about. So the idea is that you, as long as it's a minor version update, so 2.x rather than 3, that that is included in the, um, because minor by definition doesn't include breaking changes. 
um, that is then included in what the open booking API can do. So basically the open booking API is compatible with anything that isn't breaking from the object. So you can add more and more properties to it. But if someone pulls out the organizer property or the, I don't know, whatever other fundamental properties the booking API depends on, that would be a breaking change that would then obviously implicate the booking API, at which point that would need some redesign or something to. Yeah, but you, you can imagine worlds where um, you can imagine world, worlds where there's non-breaking changes. I, I'm not sure if it's exactly addressed in that paragraph, where there's non-breaking changes, but there's an additional feature, say, added to the opportunity spec, which isn't accommodated in the current open booking API. So then that creates a minor update to the open booking API. Um, and you have to account for that. That if you know, so if you're using Open Booking API 2.3, you must be using um, opportunity. Sorry, 1.3. You must be using modeling opportunity data, data version 2.3. Sorry, Tim. I think someone's typing in the background. Uh, who might not be on mute. <laughs> um, sorry, say that again, Tim. Well, I'm just. Uh, um, it, it is really about the minor version. So I, I, there are. It depends what you mean by breaking, I suppose. So if there's a minor improvement, say, introduced to the opportunity spec, so you add some some whizzy new attribute, so it becomes 2.4, say. Um, and it would be useful to take advantage of that in the open booking API, but it's currently not accommodated. Um, and then you need, in order to utilize that, you would need to use version 1.4, say. So you get those kinds of dependencies where the breaking is sort of retroactive in a sense. Um, it can get a little tangled. Yeah, I guess the 1.4, well, or one point whatever it is, because they might be different, different. Um, well, I guess yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Yeah. for the sake of example, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one point, yeah, the four that happens to coincide. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I guess it would be interesting because someone who the 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 implementations of this seem to be at the moment at least either like um, just RPD, RPD and modeling, RPD modeling and booking, or RPD modeling and customer accounts mm -hmm. and booking. So like it's one, one, two. Yeah, one, so two, a layer of cake, yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. So um, if you have to update your implementation, um, I guess it might make sense that those, I mean, it might make sense that if there is additional guidance in the open booking API necessary to explain a new attribute that's been added in the modeling spec, that that would require a new version release to include that detail because well i guess otherwise where would it that has to go somewhere and yeah, yeah. that that somewhere should probably implicate in a version bump yeah well it's not a yeah it's not an immediate problem and i mean this is certainly accommodates that possibility it just gets messy um um so yeah we can park it for park it for the moment um have this as a separate document at 1.0 um you know that's fine um and yeah let's let's get it into respec as a as a formal document yeah cool. okay yeah um that is the next action i guess um any more for any more don't think from our perspective no no steven No, nothing, nothing to add, uh, Tim. Thank you. Uh, Debbie, anything from you? No, nothing else after I threw the site bomb fell in. <laughs> <laughs> right, one, one well, grenade per session. That's the. Want to see what I'll, leave, I'll leave that and go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see what else in the, is in that bag of uh, bombs you put in for the next uh, the next time. <laughs> okay, then I will. I will thank you all very much. There's a. Just formatting, well, very minor tasks on Nick to update the specification ever so slightly, and uh, and then we'll get this into something a little more stable than a Google Doc. Okay. Um, sorry, I just have one other very, very quick question, Tim. Um, some time ago, you were going to try and correlate all of the other recordings of all of these meetings and put them somewhere that was available. Did that happen, or did I miss it? Most of them actually are up, in fact. Um, I'll send the links around. And, well, okay, that'd be great. Couple up and I'll, I'll send the links around to you. Yeah. Thanks. Tim, are they on the, you think, the W3C site? 
when you say something that's around? Uh, no, they're on the YouTube site, but not linked to, yeah. Okay. Um, would it be, I can put them on the W3C site if that would be helpful, because I think it might be easier to reference them if they're in one place rather than having lots of um, lots uh, of No, leave, leave that with me. I've been meaning to do it for a while. I will uh, get them get them linked. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I've just made you shed loads of work now. But <laughs> uh, No, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a kind of the opposite problem. It's actually not very much work. So it's one of those like, I'll do it tomorrow um, kind of things. And then, yeah, here we are months okay. later. Um, cool. Okay, thank you for that, Phil. Um, yeah, you, we are. <laughs> I'm now on record. We'll know the job is done when this video goes up, and I'm. Saying... <laughs> <laughs> but the already is. If we get the video, <laughs> exactly. That's right. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye, -bye. Bye now. Bye, -bye. Thanks, guys. Bye now.